Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to a very special edition of Inquirer Live. Uh, I am Mike Sielski, one of the Inquirer's sports columnists, uh, and also, and this is the subject of the episode today, the author of this book, The Rise, Kobe Bryant and the Pursuit of Immortality. Uh, the book came out earlier this year in January uh, nationwide, and uh, the Inquirer has graciously arranged for us uh, to take a few minutes today to speak about the book uh, and to speak about it with three people who I am eternally grateful to because they were intimately involved uh, in the reporting and research and in the telling of the story of Kobe Bryant's early life. For those of you who aren't familiar, Kobe Bryant graduated from Lower Marion High School in 1996, uh, spent most of his early life in the Philadelphia area before joining the Los Angeles Lakers, spending 20 years in the NBA, winning five NBA championships, fashioning a Hall of Fame career before, of course, his tragic death in that helicopter crash on January 26th, 2020. Uh, the book is basically the story of that early life. And as I said, I wanted to bring on really the three people who I think more than anyone else um, helped me to tell that story. So the first person I want to bring on is a gentleman who might be familiar to some long, long time Inquirer readers. Uh, he actually used to write for the Inquirer back in the early 1990s. That's how he came to meet Kobe Bryant. Uh, and that's Jeremy Treatman. So Jeremy, welcome to Inquirer Live. Thanks, Mike. Great to be here. Thank you so much for, of course, being here and more importantly, um, doing so much to help me with this book. Can you just start out a little bit by telling us how you came to meet Kobe and how you came to be so close with him? Yeah, it's a kind of a unique story because uh, I got to know the young Kobe Bryant three different ways. One was as a family friend. One was as the person who doing his first media, putting him on TV, putting him on radio, writing his first newspaper articles. And lastly, your third guest today, Greg Downer, was kind enough. Uh, to make me an am amazing offer and bring me onto the coaching staff for the 1995-96 season. So I also got to be one of uh, Kobe's assistant coaches for the senior championship year that you were talking about in 1996. But the first time I really met him was through his father, Joe. I was coaching at this Jewish day school, um, Akiva Hebrew Academy, and Joe Bryan had just come back from Italy. And after a few months off, he decided to take the girls basketball job over there. And you know, we struck up a friendship. I actually wrote a couple of articles on Joe as well. And I always idolized Joe uh, when I was a 10, 11, 12 year old kid watching him on the 77 Sixers that went to the NBA finals. And here he was teaching these girls how to play basketball. And it was incredible. And one day young Kobe walks in and we're on a, he's on a side basket, just shooting, shooting, shooting. And I'm striking up a conversation with Joe, you know, how good is Kobe? What's he like? Uh, in anything close to you and i'll never forget he said he's so much better than me at this age it's not even funny and i said joe you're six foot ten you're an mvp in italy played in the nba for many years uh you saying he's gonna be better than you he said he's gonna be so much better than me it's not even funny end of quote so before i ask jeremy my next question i would just want to remind our audience um if you want to submit a question any time during this discussion, you'll have the opportunity to do that. Just put the question in the comment section at the bottom of this page. And if you're watching us on social media, just head over to inquirerwithanei.com backslash live, and you'll be able to access this and ask your question there. So Jeremy, let's bring it back to you for a second. You sure. get to be close with Kobe. You meet him. You're writing about him. You get to be a family friend of the Bryants. You get to be a confidant of Kobe, you get to be an assistant coach and kind of a media relations rep for the Lower Marion boys basketball team during that state championship run during Kobe's senior year. You also embarked on what you hoped would be a really special project with Kobe. Uh, can you tell us, tell me a little bit about that? Tell the audience a little bit about that. I assume you're talking about uh, my freshman year in the NBA, a book I wanted to write on Kobe Bryant. Uh, that me and Kobe and Joe had discussed uh, entering into his 12th grade year um, when they confided in me that he was going to jump from high school to the NBA. I came up with this title for a book and pitched it to him. They, they loved it. And I was doing all these interviews. And 25 years later, 
we can read about them in the rise and hear about them on your podcast. And it's uh, so exciting to have worked with you on this to, uh, you know, make my dream kind of come to fruition 25 years later, 30 years later. It's uh, maybe even more magical than it was intended to be. Um, so, yeah, that was something I, I, I was trying to do. It uh, unfortunately didn't it didn't get finished. Um, it's like Beethoven's Unfinished Symphony, but you finished it, Mike. So uh, I'm grateful, and uh, I think it's uh, really awesome. So to give people an indication of just how close you were with Kobe at that time and how much time you spent with him, we actually have a photograph um, of you and Kobe together. Can you tell the audience where this was? Yeah, this was the uh, Gatorade High School uh, Player of the Year dinner that he was told he could just come with his parents, and he decided to invite the whole team. It was at Kansas City Prime. The restaurant's no longer there in Maniunk, and we all went. Uh, Coach Danner, who you'll meet in just a couple minutes, and that was pretty exciting. And I remember I I I, uh, I jumped in here to take the picture, and Pam Pam Bryant. Kobe's mother called me like two weeks later, said, Jeremy, you got to come over to the house. I got this incredible picture for you. So I believe me, I have this picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, during the course of your interviews with Kobe, you talked to him at the end of 1995, uh, throughout 1996, even into 1997 after he had joined the Lakers. Um, and a, a good bulk, having listened to these tapes, and just to quickly tell a story um, about how I came to come into possession of these tapes. Jeremy and I have been friends for the better part of 25 years. Uh, and when I got the idea to do the book about Kobe, I reached out to him. He was one of the first people, if not the first person I reached out to, uh, to ask for help. And he, Jeremy was kind enough. He had transcripts of some of these tapes that were kind of written in Kobe's voice. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, I haven't seen the tapes in 20, 25 years. I'm not sure where they are. Fast forward to December 22nd, 2020. 8.30 at night, uh, I'm home, I get a phone call uh, from Jeremy. Now, mind you, my book deadline is in February. And Jeremy calls me and says, Mike, I found the tapes. Jeremy had been cleaning out his garage, preparing to move from Maniunk to Boca Raton, Florida. And in a box on a shelf in his garage, he found these micro cassette tapes. Uh, so the next morning, I threw my mask on against COVID. I drive over to his house. Uh, he hands me this giant Ziploc bag full of micro cassette tapes. He hands me the micro cassette recorder that he used to record these tapes. And I was able to use them both to write the book and to create uh, a podcast called I Am Kobe, uh, where you can actually hear the vast majority of these tapes. And actually, we have a snippet of one of them right now. Jeremy and Kobe spent a lot of time during the summer of 1996 speaking about Kobe's upcoming career in the NBA. He had just been acquired by the Lakers during the 1996 draft. Uh, and he spoke about what he thought it was going to be like to play in the NBA. On a nightly basis, a guy can come out and you have to realize that life, on a nightly basis, a guy can come out and kill you. <laughs> so you just got to prepare yourself. And I, I think that I know I'm going to prepare myself. And if a guy comes out and kill me, I'm not going to sit back and just let him kill me. I'm going to do everything I can to stop him. And if you, even if he does light me up, I have to look at the video tape and see what did he do that that beat me every time. <laughs> Next time I play him, I'm gonna know every move. I'm gonna know when he touches his nose, when he touches his ear. I'm gonna know everything. I don't want to get killed. Did you tell him you're gonna go in the game? No, I never told him. I think he had depression or what? And of course, that was Jeremy's voice you hear in the background there. Jeremy, what goes through your mind when you hear that snippet? It's funny, Mike, uh, in, in listening to, to your podcast and a lot of the tapes that I hadn't heard since I interviewed Kobe, 95 to 98, or maybe even up to 2000, can't 100% remember. Uh, some of them I remember vividly and some of them I don't. That one I remember vividly. And you can just hear the young, honest, earnest Kobe Bryant right there. So innocent and yet wanting it all at age 17 and and. He's like, no one's going to beat me in the NBA. And, and you can just feel the passion and the drive. But you can also feel that he was 17 and 18 years old at the time. Uh, it's very touching to hear it. Well, one of the things I wanted to accomplish in the book was not just to dwell on Kobe's basketball life uh, as a teenager at Lower Marion. I really wanted to tell 
uh, the full story of him and his life in his teenage years and try to give as broad a perspective on that as possible. And one of the uh, incredible uh, moments, I'd say, during my research was getting introduced to our next guest. And our next guest is Dana Tolbert, who was a close friend of Kobe's, close friend of the Bryant family uh, during that period. Uh, Dana, thank you so much for, for joining us today. And again, thank you for everything you did uh, to help me with the rise. Oh, no problem. You're welcome. So describe, if you can, for the audience, kind of the nature of your relationship, both with Kobe uh, and with the Bryant family as a whole. Um, well, I guess the first time I saw Kobe had to be in middle school. He just popped up one day <laughs> in the eighth grade. Um, and everyone was just trying to figure out who he was. He just wanted to play sports all day long. He played basketball and baseball. And um, by the time I got to the ninth grade, that's when I met Shea and you know the rest of the family. And he had already solidified himself as like a household name and a basketball star. And they were already talking of going to states by the time he was a sophomore um, amongst the students. So we were all expecting it. So when it happened, of course, it was even more sweet, but you know, he was just a, he was a, a regular person. He was down to earth. He had a huge sense of humor. He loved to clown around and, and joke and laugh, but he also had a serious side. He was about getting his work done and handling his business. And so he knew how to work hard and, and he played, he played, but basketball definitely came first. Education definitely came first. One of the great perspectives that you lent me during the course of speaking with you for The Rise, and, and you pointed me in some other different directions as well in terms of who to talk to and angles to explore, mm -hmm. um, was the adjustment that Kobe had to make to coming from Italy, uh, living abroad for eight years, for the better part of eight years, and kind of entering this milieu at Lower Marion High School uh, as, a, as a Black teenager in kind of what was regarded as a posh suburban school district. Um, in what ways did, in what ways did he have to adjust from what you could see? And in what ways, um, was that, what was that environment like, I guess, for, you know, for somebody to go through it at that time? Okay. Um, you, you're definitely, it was two middle schools out there. And the one that we went to had the least amount of black students and majority of those students lived in Ardmore, a small handful adjacent to Ardmore. So you're kind of already seen as an outsider and then everyone's trying to figure out who you are. It's, it's a fine line. You're dancing. You really learn how to be an individual because you don't fit in with anyone. And Kobe to that end, uh, I think you were the one who, who clued me into this. And I did not know this before I started researching the book, uh, joined the student voice organization at Lower Marion, which was the basically the black student union. Um, and it seemed like he was kind of, from what you and other people mentioned to me, kind of trying to search for his identity um, in terms of who he was and where he fit in uh, in the culture of Lower Marion. Is that kind of an accurate way of, of looking at it? Oh yeah, 100%. Um, because, you know, for a typical kid, you wanna fit in. You wanna just um, go along with what everyone else is doing. But if you're already new to the area and you're black, it's it's a little bit trickier. And um, if you're studious and athletic, like it's it's an odd combination. So that definitely helped him to, um, I guess you could say, make time for all all of all of his black friends. I get busy. He was very busy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he yeah. was always very busy, and he, his schedule was always full. So. You know, when it was during the season, he wasn't able to make it as much just like anyone who played sports. But a good number of us wore several hats and played sports. So we would pop in, do what we need to do. And he would always participate when he was there and, and add to everything going on. He was my Pollyanna one year. I mean, there was nothing that he didn't participate in. I don't know when the man slept. <laughs> <laughs> How did he and his presence and his basketball excellence change things at upper at lower Marion. I almost said upper Marion, excuse me, at lower Marion. Um, you know, I know basketball, the, the, the team was kind of mediocre. Basketball was not a big part of the culture at the school until he got there. How obviously he changed that. Describe how he changed it, how things changed in that regard. It turned into 
pretty much a frenzy overnight. He was local famous before anyone else in the country knew who he was. Um, people were excited about it. That's all we talked about. We actually started a drill team um, for those of us that were not on the cheerleading squad. And we used to drill at the games and at the pep rallies. Um, and it was it was just for fun. He made everyone pretty much step up the expectations of athletes that come from Lower Marion High School. We were, I mean, we were already doing good in several other sports, but it definitely made them focus on basketball. Dana, I want to ask you, we've been getting some questions dropped into uh, the chat room uh, here on, at Inquire Live. And uh, one of them comes in and asks, you know, Kobe jumped straight from high school to the NBA. Uh, and Dana, you got an, obviously an up close look at him as a student. Um, what might his college life and career have been like um, had he decided to go to, say, Duke, Kentucky, LaSalle, any one of those places that he considered? Um, he would have excelled. He, he would have been the same household name at a college level that he was in the NBA level. Um, he was just always extremely healthy. And if he would have gotten any type of injury during that time, that definitely would have derailed his value whenever he was looking to get drafted to the NBA. So with his intelligence, I understood why his parents and, and his family felt very comfortable with him going straight to the NBA. Now, Jeremy, you knew before just about anybody else that Kobe wasn't going to go to college, that he was going to go right to the NBA. Um, what, take that question on. You know, Suppose he had decided, I'm going to go to college. Um, how do you think he'd have fared? Oh, I think he would have done great, just like Dana said. I mean, if he'd gone to Duke, uh, I know Duke is not necessarily a school where somebody has a standout freshman year, even if they're going to turn into a future NBA star. But I think Kobe would have been a little bit different there. I think, you know, very possibly could have been the player of the year as a freshman. And I think they would have been in line for one of those final fours. And I think he would have loved being a student. And I think he would have excelled with the mm -hmm. students. So I, I, I don't think he would have had any problem, but his mind was on the NBA. His mind was on the NBA from the time he was in Italy watching the tapes that his grandparents were sending him of Magic Johnson and Michael Jordan. And he that's where his mind was because he didn't grow up here. His mind wasn't really on college basketball that much the way uh, a normal high school basketball player would be coming through here. He only, only was here for four years. Everybody else grew up with March Madness for 18 years. So he was thinking about the NBA. Now, there was that, of course, famous press conference at Lower Marion where Kobe announced he was going to take his talent to the NBA. And, you know, years later, LeBron, LeBron James kind of stole that line from him or at least copied him uh, when he announced that he was leaving Cleveland to go play for the Miami Heat. Uh, and a few weeks after that, Kobe had his senior prom. And he took someone very, very famous. And I want to ask you guys about that after we hear – this clip of him talking about his date to the 1996 Lower Marion Senior Prom. With myself to pick Brandy up at the Marriott. And man, she like, she glowed, man. That's Kobe, of course, talking about uh, Brandy Norwood, who in 1996 was a multi million, you know, multi platinum recording artist, had a television show, Moesha. That was incredibly popular. Uh, Dana, I saw you chuckle. Um, what comes to mind when you hear that clip? Oh, that's that's Kobe. Like I said, he he speaks his mind. He doesn't say much unless you know him, and then he lets it all out. But sometimes he can just say a couple words, and you know everything he said and everything he didn't say. <laughs> that that prom was a gigantic news event. You know, Dana Dana used the term. Kobe going from local famous to being national famous. And I think the prom is a great indication. I get into this in the book about how it came about and why it came about. Um, when you guys think back to that first Dana and then Jeremy, what comes to mind about Kobe and the idea of him taking Brandy, who at the time might as well have been Beyonce or Rihanna uh, in the pop culture, in, in American pop culture, to his senior prom? Dana, you first and then Jeremy. Um, the norm. First, it was shock, then it wasn't because it's Kobe. <laughs> so it was expected. <laughs> and he handled it. He took it all in stride. Like it was just like he was taking one of our classmates to the prom. So it, it was it was traditional Kobe. <laughs> Mike, do you, 
you, you asked me about the tapes, and this was another one that I remember uh, succinctly. He was at the BET Awards and was hanging with boys to men, and they had him in, in their hotel room and said, you want to you go out with Brandy? Do, it. Do you want to meet Brandy? He's like, Brandy, uh, do you want to take her to your prom? He goes, yeah. And then next thing you know, he was on the phone with her. So I remember him telling that story, and he was, he was kind of glowing about it. Um, I'm kind of with Dana there. It's Kobe. At, at first, it was a shock. When, when he first told me he was, uh, when I first heard he was going to uh, prom with Brandy, I was like, Brandy who? <laughs> and then it's like, <laughs> it's just, uh, he, he just took it all in stride. It just seemed to happen organically, even though it was pretty amazing to go out with a pop star like that. That was public. Kobe Dana, what was he like in private? I mean, I know he had kind of a girlfriend throughout high school. Um, you know, socially, what was he like amongst his, you know, his close friends? You guys had a kind of a, a I think you described it almost like a cocoon around him, you know, a group of friends who kind of looked out for him, um, mm -hmm. made sure he always kind of had somebody. You know, that was public Kobe. What was a little more private Kobe like? Um, Kobe was. He was a jokester. <laughs> he loved to crack jokes. He loved to make you laugh. He loved for the people around him to smile because he felt good and he wanted everyone around him to feel good. That's why it was kind of a shock. Like when he he did become more famous and people were reading him completely different. I said, who, who he is on the court is not who he is in his personal life. That's business. But I mean, he was the type of person you could talk to about anything, would give you the best advice, would give you great conversation. He was just an all around really good person. What did he, um, and, and what would you see of him on the basketball court? Like contrast, you know, describe him if you can as a, as a basketball player, I guess, in contrast to oh, who he was, was on the court. He was a beast. <laughs> <laughs> he had that switch and he would turn it on and he would get it done. And we had a few players here and there over the years that had that type of mentality, but that's what he was 24 seven. I mean, even just playing pickup during lunch, with underclassmen, he still had it turned on. And then when he was off the court, he would turn it right off. <laughs> Jeremy, what were some of the uh, the most memorable moments you saw of Kobe uh, on the court, whether at practice, uh, during a game, um, anything that showed really how competitive a person he was and an athlete he was? Well, one of the stories uh, you detailed in your book and the other I thought you had in your book, but you didn't, so I'll, I'll tell it uh, now. <laughs> The first, Thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> sure, yeah, sorry about that. I'm sure Greg's chuckling as he hears this because he's heard the story so many times, but he was the coach and he witnessed it. Uh, there's a three on three drill, full court, as I remember. And he was playing with Rob Schwartz and somebody else. And Rob was our 15th guy on the team, sort of a JV varsity swing player. And it was a high game. And Kobe's like, Rob, Rob, give me the ball, Rob, Rob. And Rob, I remember like yesterday, he goes like this with a fake. He uses the greatest player in America as a decoy, takes one hard dribble, tries to make a bank shot, it cranks off the rim. The other team goes down and scores. Kobe took the ball and spiked it, and he didn't take his eyes off him for the next like 68 minutes of practice, even to the bathroom, to the water fountain, as I remember, just glaring at him. And I remember driving home thinking, I never knew. I mean, I knew Kobe for four years at that point. I never seen like a jerk side of him. And I'm driving home and I'm like, oh my God, that's what makes him great. He hates to lose. And I called up Greg. I said, did something historical just happen today? Did I miss something? He goes, Jeremy, you just witnessed Kobe Bryant losing the first drill in high school and he's pissed. And that really, I learned a lot from that. I mean, if it weren't for Greg, I wouldn't have learned the basketball side, the mama mentality side of, of a young Kobe Bryant. It was just fascinating to see. And the other story that... Somehow I failed to tell Mike because he was writing the book, but I made up for it because I found the tapes, right? <laughs> so You made uh, up for a lot by finding the tapes. I made up for a lot with by finding the tapes. But anyway, uh, there was a scheduling uh, snafu one day, and we were in the girls' gym, and we were about to have practice, and Tom McGovern, the AD, came in and said, really sorry, guys, uh, can't practice today. The girls have to be in here. The boys are wrestling in the main gym, so you guys are off today. 14 players were high-fiving and screaming, yeah, no practice. They bolted out of there so fast. Kobe Bryant took a basketball and pounded it off the wall and says, this is ridiculous. I mean, I'm saying the words I can say right here. <laughs>
we have to practice. We're going for a state championship. And everyone left. I think Greg stayed, but I know I stayed. And I just watched him. He practiced by himself for the, for the next hour. I, I stayed that day. It was very interesting. It was just fascinating to, to see that. Um, and I'm just telling some stories where he gets upset because of, uh, you know, you know his, his penchant for winning and wanting to practice. But he was an amazing teammate. He was an amazing player. And he, he just made everybody so much better. And it was just to see somebody with that much passion um, to be the best was incredible. Well, you've made a couple mentions of the man who I think when people think of Kobe's young life, when they think of him at Lower Marion High School, um, the first name they think of uh, in conjunction with him is Greg Downer. And okay. with that, I'm going to bring Greg on um, to the screen as well uh, and thank him for being here. Um, there he is. Greg has been uh, the head boys basketball coach at Lower Marion since 1990. Uh, he is now the two-time defending District 1 Class 6A champion. He and his, his team, the Aces, uh, they just, unfortunately for them, bowed out in the state semifinals the other day. Uh, and Greg was, of course, um, the coach of the team in 1995-1996 when the Aces won the District 1 championship and the program's first state championship in 53 years. Uh, Greg, thank you so much for being with us today. Hi, Mike. Good to be here. So you get asked, you, you were the person who... Anytime anyone ever needed to do a story about Kobe Bryant and they were going to talk to somebody from Lower Marion, you were the person who that writer or that TV reporter uh, would seek out. How did your relationship with Kobe develop over the years? Tell us about the first time you met him, saw him play basketball, and then how your relationship with him developed over time. I met him when he was a 13-year-old eighth grader at Balcombe Middle School. Um, I had heard that there was a good player there, so I, I went to watch him play. Um, invited him to work out with our with our current varsity. Kind of started uh, establishing our uh, initial relationship. Um, connected with the father, connected with the mother, um, connected with both of his sisters who were already at Lower Marion. Um, was smart enough to hire him for a job as a as a camp counselor in the summer at, at the Shipley School, summer heading into to ninth grade year. But uh, the initial cornerstones of the relationship were meeting him when he was literally 13 years old, um, finding out pretty quickly how amazingly talented he was and um, basically saying to myself, uh, he's going to be an ace for four years and uh, no one's going to take him away from us. <laughs> I think it, at one point you said to Jeremy, I'm pretty sure I have this in the book that, you know, Kobe's a sophomore and you kind of lean over to him and say, does anybody around here understand that we have the next Michael Jordan in our gym? Is that, is that an accurate story? Yeah. Yeah. I remember saying that. And when you saw the sheer athleticism and some of the things he, he was doing, it would be outlandish to make a statement like that for someone that was 15, 16 years old. But I was just driving around one day and I thought to myself, there's no way this could be any different than what Penny Hardaway's doing, what Grant Hill is doing, what Michael Jordan is doing. I mean, Kobe's playing two or three feet above the rim. He's dunking every which way. And uh, I like Dana's reference to um, initially he was a localized star. And I think we knew that he was going to be a national star, but we, we knew it. The insiders knew it before, before the outsiders knew it. And he was a local star. And then pretty quickly, I guess, heading into junior year, he became very national. One of the things I wanted to do in the book was to show how Kobe's presence and excellence and his rise, you know, to becoming the best high school player in the country kind of affected the people and the entities and institutions around him, whether it was Lower Marion High School, you know, some of the, the colleges and universities that were recruiting him. And I kind of honed in on LaSalle 
um, you know, in particular in that regard, just because Kobe spoke about it a lot. And I thought it was kind of an interesting, dramatic um, storyline. But, you know, Greg, you had, you were one of those kind of planets kind of orbiting Kobe. And I'm wondering, describe if you can, because we, we ended up talking about this in a fair amount of depth. We would, you know, during the summer and spring of 2020, Greg and I would sit on his back deck at his home and socially distance and spend hours talking about Kobe in those years. You had an awful lot of pressure on you, both externally and then from, I would imagine, what Kobe applied every day, you know, kind of setting a standard that I'm sure you felt like you had to meet. What was that like? You were in your early 30s, you know, and you're coaching this kind of supernova. What, what was it like? Well, I always say that funny line, you know, Co a Kobe Bryant and a couple of good players can lead us to a state title. You know, a Kobe Bryant with a sprained ankle can lead us to a 500 season. Um, so th there was pressure, but, you know, I, I was young. I was naive. I had a lot of energy and really I'm a sheer competitor also. That's why I've stayed in this business all these years and and I love to compete and there, there certainly was pressure, but there was so much newness about everything, the big crowds and the, the exciting bus rides and playing good opponents that I think, you know, things were kind of moving so quickly that I didn't really probably have too much time to, uh, to damage my mental health. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the team that you guys were kind of um, shooting four that you knew you had to topple if you wanted to win either a district title and or a state title was Chester High School. Um, and I think we've got a photograph here um, of Kobe and you guys uh, playing against Chester in the 1996 district championship game. You guys had lost uh, to Chester in 1995 in the district title game in Kobe's junior year. And it was a pretty one-sided affair. You guys lost by 27 points. Um, what was the difference when you guys come back and play Chester the following year in the district championship game, uh, you beat them 60 to 53. And then of course you play them again in the state playoffs for the chance to go to the state championship game in the Palestra, 9,000 people. Uh, and you beat them again this time in overtime. Chester seems like kind of the perfect foil for Kobe and for lower Marion at that time. What was it about them that made them kind of the, uh, the opponent that you guys had to topple if you wanted to, to celebrate a state championship? Well, during, during the nineties and eighties and, and for so long, everything goes through the orange and black, you know, the Chester Clippers, um, Jeremy and myself have so much respect for Fred Pickett and all the amazing heritage of that program. And, I mean, they've won probably 20 some district championships. And look, I coached a lot of those Chester kids. I, I told you that in, in the Keystone State games. And I got a firsthand look at their toughness, their their grittiness, their their love of basketball. And when you're a little kid in Chester, one of the main things you want to do is is to put on an orange and black uniform and it's it's one of the greatest uh, parts of of that of that neighborhood, and uh, we just knew that if we were going to accomplish anything, it would be inevitable that we would have to get through them. Dana, you and I during the research and reporting for the book talked about the dynamic, kind of the difference between Chester and Lower Marion when it came to Kobe, when it came to kind of the reaction to Kobe's rise and his place and kind of the excellence of basketball and what basketball meant to each of those high schools. Um, could you speak to that? How different was it? And, and was there any kind of tension between, you know, people who were affiliated with Chester and people who were kind of affiliated with Lower Marion? Okay. Well, that, that rivalry was crazy. And the year in 96 where we won States, it was probably the worst it could have gotten. Um, they did not like the idea of a black kid from a white suburbs kicking on the butts of all of their kids. So I think in that game in 96, even the parents in the stands tried to fight us. <laughs> 
So <laughs> it wow. got a little wild. Um, it, it it really didn't help. We 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 loved it because at that point, like I said, we were on cloud nine, and it, we didn't even realize how how serious that actually was because we were kids. But the parents were actually trying to fight us. It was pretty bad. And we had to get escorted onto the bus by a few people that really didn't mind getting in the middle. So, well, but I mean, it, Jeremy, it was worth the win. It made it all more sweet. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jeremy, you could speak to this because you were around basketball a lot back then and still are. I mean, you're, you're a promoter and, and you're involved with high school basketball all over the country, setting up games and through your broadcasting camps and all that. Um, but I think, you know, Lower Marion, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Jeremy, really kind of had to prove that Kobe and that team had to prove that they were tough enough to beat a team like Chester. Um, because the perception was that, as Dana kind of alluded to, you know, they must be soft because they're from the suburbs and they're they're not hardened enough to be able to beat a team that comes from this, a city like Chester and has the basketball tradition that Chester does. So I would agree with that, and I would even take it a step further. That was one of the reasons people didn't understand how good Kobe Bryant was mm -hmm. until maybe 11th grade and certainly 12th grade, um, because – all, all I'd hear when I was talking about Kobe Bryant in 1992, three, four, five, he's beating Radner, he's beating Haverford. He's not that good. He, they can't beat Roman. They can't beat this team. He doesn't play in the city. And it was the same thing. Uh, you know, Greg's doing everything he can to get them there, to get to be a state championship team. And uh, his motivating uh, the team, uh, we came out, by the way, in that district title game that you, you referenced to the 27-point loss the year before, and Greg brings it. We, we come out with these white shirts with 27 on the back. And uh, we, we wore the 53 because we hadn't won a state championship in 1943. Greg had little tricks all through the year. So I would say the combination of that, the improvement of the of the younger players, and then the rise of Kobe from here to here, senior year is what put us over Chester. But it was a mental hurdle. And I, I think Greg and Kobe deserve the credit for getting over that mm -hmm. mental hurdle um, to get the state championship and get by Chester twice. Greg, you were in a tough spot in that if Lower Marion wins the district and state championship, well, you have Kobe Bryant. You have the best player in, in the country. Of course, you should win the district and state championship. And if you don't, if you lose, well, he can't coach. He had the best player in the country and, and you know, he couldn't win the championship. When you guys did win the state championship, when you beat Erie Cathedral Prep in Hershey, and it was, it was pretty much a nail biter of a game right up until the very end. Was there more joy or was there more relief? I think it was joy, just pure joy to be, uh, to take this school that had so many people thinking it couldn't do it. Just pure joy getting to the mountaintop and uh, a little bit of, uh, a little bit of good stuff for me having accomplished it. You know, it was Kobe's senior year. It was his last time through. And, uh, you know, the the pregame dance party, the postgame dance party, the the postgame locker room and the parade back at the school. And it was it was so much fun. And, uh, you know, something that uh, we'll never forget. So we have a question from uh, one of our viewers. Uh, it's directed at Greg, but after he answers it, I would love to get Dana and Jeremy's perspective on this too. Were there any pitfalls um, once Kobe decided and, and made clear he was going to go to the NBA? Were there any potential pitfalls that Greg or maybe Dana or Jeremy might have counseled Kobe about? Um, and if so, what was his reaction to that advice? Greg, I'll start with you, and then we can go to Dana and Jeremy. Well, I think he had very involved parents and Joe being a pro player could answer a lot of the questions. I mean, my concern was you're a 17 year old kid about to be cut a million dollar check and you're, you're heading to this uh, little bit of a temptatious town called Hollywood. Um, so, you know, it, that was, that was a concern, but uh, his parents were on it. His parents actually lived out there with him for a few years. And my reservation was, uh, can any person of that tender age um, survive without a really square head on their shoulders? And, and Kobe was able to do it because he was so devoted to, uh, to the basketball. 
Dana, did, did it ever come up, you know, during your friendship with him to, you know, lend him any advice about turning pro or anything like that? Um, no, I can definitely say at, at that point, you know, his mind was already made up and um, everyone was, re- all of his friends were really just showing him support. My only concern was that he was going from playing with boys to men. And I was hoping that he would rise to the occasion. He surpassed my expectations. I, I was shocked at how fast he rose to that occasion. Uh, Jeremy, I want you to answer the, the same question, but I, I want to point out, and this, this was one of the things that in a way kind of most surprised me uh, in doing the reporting and research for the book was, you know, Jeremy, you knew that Kobe was going to go to the NBA basically through, you know, from the beginning of his senior year on. You knew that and you kind of kept it a secret because Kobe had kind of a tight, tight knit circle. It was so tight, in fact, that Greg, you mentioned this and Jeremy, you confirmed it and Kobe confirms it on those tapes. Kobe never told Greg <laughs> that he was going to the NBA. Um, and, you know, that, that, that kind of just blew me away in some respect because I know how close Kobe and Greg were. So, Jeremy, A, did you counsel Kobe in any regard? And B, why do you think he did that? Why do you think he, he didn't tell Greg? I think he wanted to make sure Greg came to the press conference. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that I can't answer, but I can tell you that, um, man, that, that is a tough one. Uh, can you go back to the, yeah, just the, the counseling. Did you give him any advice? Did you, you know, try to, not. I never felt I was, I, I, I had any right to, to give advice. The only thing I asked him, the only thing I was concerned about, Dana was saying going from boys to men and Greg was talking about how does anybody, can anybody be that mature to, to do what he's going to try to do? My thing was I thought about basketball and I was like, okay, he's going to be here. If he goes to college, is he going to get to here? Is he going to get to here if he does this? And that was the only thing. And I, I did, I did ask him that. He said, absolutely. Cause I, I knew, we could, you know, I was thinking he could be one of the all time greats and Greg thought he was going to be one of the all time greats. That was really what I was thinking about. Uh, but no, I certainly would never ever have, have butt in. I, I didn't have the right to do that. I just, it didn't feel comfortable doing that. Greg, I'll throw it to you. Why, why do you think Kobe never said anything explicitly? I mean, you 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 kind of had a good idea, I know, that he was going to go to the NBA. But why do you think he never explicitly said, hey, coach, just so you know, don't bother taking the calls from Patino at Kentucky or Coach K at Duke. Uh, you know, I'm going to the league. He evidently told my brother on the day of the press conference. So may, maybe he yeah. thought that was close enough. Um. But that was in May. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Um, you know, kind of the, the mystery of Kobe, and he, he liked to be dramatic, and maybe he felt if he kept his head coach on pins and needles, it would it would add to the drama. Well, and, well, go ahead, Jeremy. Mike, um, so I assume Greg knew the whole time, but I was never 100% sure, but we sort of danced around the topic. Um, but I was always dying to talk to Greg. <laughs> but I, I remember asking you, like, maybe in 2017, by the way, did you know? And he goes, no, I didn't know. I go, okay. Well, I've been wait, waiting to ask you that for 20 years. So, like, <laughs> well, well, one of the th- you did get to ask Kobe about the NBA um, and how he felt like he would handle it, um, what his expectations were. And I think in, we have a clip of that, and I think it kind of gives an indication that even at 17, 18 years old, he was already kind of flashing certainly some of that Mamba mentality that he became famous for throughout his career with the Lakers. Let's let's hear this clip. Los Angeles Laker. I was a little married and now I'm a Laker. And I was kind of surprised and shocked at first, but you know, now it's just like, okay, now I want to win a championship. I'm not stepping in there saying, okay, I just want to have a nice move season. If you get a championship, fine. If it wasn't college finals, fine. It's not like that. I want to get to the championship. I want to get there now. It's going to be like that every every year. I win a championship next year. Next season, I'll come back and say, look, man, I want to get a championship again. I'm saying, Shaq, come on, man. Let's go. Let's get this. Let's, let's get another one. Michael got four. Let's get five, man. Come on, let's go. You know what I'm saying? So that, that's how it's going to be from this point on. 
to each of you, I'll start with Greg and then Jeremy and Dana. What did you admire most about Kobe? His, his um, fearlessness and his uh, just concentration and uh, to be the best that he could be. Jeremy. For me, it was having a dream and setting out to do it. And then, as Dana kind of alluded to before, and Greg's told me a million times, and, and exceeding it all and actually making it happen. I mean, I've been lucky enough to know somebody that gifted who was a phenom and said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and then do it. And then send a message to the world that mediocrity is not accepted. You got to... I, you know, I, I want people to be great. I want people to strive for the best. Don't settle. You know, all the messages of that are all the things that I admire the most about him. Dana, how about you? Um, I admire his heart and his drive the most. Uh, he had a, has a really big heart, and you don't really find that too much in people nowadays. And he always did. Um, and his 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 will and his drive to never give up and to never stop and accomplish anything that he thought of. And the fact that he had that type of um, makeup as a kid is something that will always sit with me. Most of us take at least 10, 15, 20 years as an adult to reach that. And he was already there as a teenager. Yeah, and I, I think you hit it, Dana. That, that to me is what made him such a fascinating figure. Um, and that is the big reason why I wanted to kind of dive into that part of his life. Um, you know, I've been telling people since the book came out that I wanted to to write Batman Begins for the Black Mamba. I wanted to do Kobe's origin story. And I think the fact that he knew what he wanted to do and knew who he wanted to be at such an early age and was willing to do anything it took to get to that point, um, mm -hmm. people, that, that resonates with people. Um, you know, people respond to that in a very positive way. Um, so listen, our, our time has kind of run out here. Um, I wanna thank Jeremy Treatman, Dana Tolbert, and of course, Greg Downer um, for joining me today on Inquire Live. And again, um, thank you all for joining to speak about this, the rise, Kobe Bryant and the pursuit of immortality. Thank you, everyone.